Thank you, Bona, for that kind introduction. And um, it is really so nice to see you all here. Um, I, I've attended um, several of these uh, sessions, and um, I am really, really honored to be part of the series. So thank you for arranging this um, for us. Um, <clears throat> hope is, um, I mean, um, my favorite subject, um, and I keep thinking about it and keep writing about it. <laughs> um, but you know, my my understanding of hope also keeps changing, um, and I I think um, that's just not just because of me, but uh, has something to do with the nature of the subject, and and I think hope is a really el elusive um, subject, and I think what I think you do with the subjects like hope is to move and be one with it and and um, and, and capture that that movement. I think, um, but at the same time, so um, I, I kind of realize that subjects like hope really cannot in be kind of discussed and talked about in a too serious fashion. Um, and, and one of the techniques uh, of hope uh, we kind of identify in this book is um, humor. And, and, uh, but I'm not, you know, I'm Japanese, and I'm from Japan, and I'm not really <laughs> good at uh, being humorous. So, and, uh, <laughs> so uh, um, I'll uh, defer that to uh, my Swedish uh, colleague um, who will speak uh, after me. So I'll be very serious in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. So um, I think one, um, one, one top um, theme uh, that emerges from this uh, project is that, uh, is that hope is a social phenomenon a hope and, and also a social problem. And, and this understanding is you know, somewhat commonsensical, but um, it's important because people often approach hope as a kind of psychological kind of issue, like individual issue. But it's a it's a it's a relational and social issue, and I think um, at this moment um, of of history, in particular U.S. is not only U.S. history but also um, human history. <laughs> I think um, we all kind of share the understanding that we need hope, right? <laughs> and you know, in terms of um, today's politics, I think that's something really lacking and. Um, and we are in need of hope. I think and one of the things we like, we wanted to capture through this title, The Economy of Hope, is that hope seems to become an important subject of reflection when it's absent. Right? So this, that's kind of one kind of economy of hope. But it's a, um, it's a social phenomenon, that's a an, an social problem. And, and there are lots of people for over the last two decades uh, that, uh, um, who have an identified hope as a social issue and use hope as a, as a tool for analyzing um, and capturing um, uh, what's happening in, 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 in the world. So um, I'll just uh, introduce a couple of um, um, ideas here um, put forward by um, um, anthropologist, Australian anthropologist Dagasan Haj, and also a Japanese sociologist Masahiro Yamada, both um, point to uh, the same kind of idea. Um, so society has lost kind of collective, kind of shared hope, um, perhaps because of uh, the shrinking economy and declining economy and resources are more scarce, and um, no one really believes in um, progress and economic development. And then within that context, hope seems to be unevenly distributed now. And um, Gus and Haj pointed out that the, the, in Australia, um, um, there seem to be people who are just angry, right? And, and who, who, who felt that the, who, who feel that uh, they have lost like the sense of the future. And that sounds kind of familiar now after um, the last election. I think we, we kind of um, have a sense of anger among certain people in this country, and, and we can analyze the, what's happening today in, in, in these um, lines. And it's, I think hope may be understood as something 
a resource that's been um, unevenly distributed, and as a result, certain people, um, you know, who used to take for granted certain sense of progress or the futurity or hope, um, are now angry and uh, at those people who seem to have hope. And um, Masahiro Yamada also um, diagnosed Japanese societies as hope stratified society. And he even said that today, in today's world, it is hope, not wealth, that really um, is, uh, is unevenly distributed. So these are just two um, quite uh, well known examples of um, sociological studies that um, have deployed hope as an analytic. Right? But, um, um, but also, uh, we have experienced a series of natural disasters and crises over the last uh, uh, two decades. And every time something really disturbing happens, something catastrophic happens, um, uh, we often kind of talk about, you know, ask ourselves the, the question about hope, where hope is, and um, et cetera. Um, so for me personally, um, that was that that moment came when an earthquake hit Japan six years ago, um, the massive tsunami, and um, um, that devastated the north eastern uh, coast of Japan. And I was in Tokyo, and I was really literally shaken, and um, I really thought that the, my family and I uh, will perish in 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 in, in the. In the in, in, in experiencing those tremors. And then after the earthquake and tsunami, of course, uh, on the um, uh, Fukushima Daiichi um, nuclear power plant um, um, exploded, and um, there was a massive um, contamination of uh, soil and food um, chains uh, uh, with uh, radioactive substance. So that, that put Japan in a really dark period um, and, and and dark and also a very period of deep uncertainty. Um, so I, I I can easily um, think about the, what has happened um, in Japan in terms of um, hope. Um, so you know the, the, the that, that that natural disaster you know followed a long period of recession, and you know there was an effort. Um, by um, Prime Minister Koizumi and others to re refashion the Japanese economy through neoliberal neo reform, but you know Jap Japanese economy um, uh, was not able to kind of get out of the recession, and then tsunami and nuclear power plant accident um, happened. Um, but then um, Prime Minister Abe came in, and this is a, um, this is an effort to really sort of background all these bad things. And um, um, through uh, quantitative easing, um, a new kind of monetary policy, and um, bring bring that monetary policy together with uh, um, this effort to make um, Japan strong again with these uh, airplanes and <laughs> himself. Um, so this this um, this was a kind of an effort to re re inject uh, hopefulness. Um, you know, when it comes to hope, you know, we tend to um, want to differentiate good hopes from bad hopes, um, but um, you know, it's actually quite difficult to do so. Um, and and, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more. But um, I think we can think about these moments in, in recent history of Japan as an effort to. Um, the, the moments at which kind of hope was lost and hope was regained and hope, a different kind of hope was uh, reinserted and re-injected. So, so this is kind of my personal um, you know, um, background um, to, to uh, this study of hope. Um, so, um, but um, the question remains, what is hope? Um, there are many, many answers to this question, and that's really part of the problem of hope. So um, I can just go through quickly the variations um, in the conceptualizations of hope. And one of the most uh, prominent um, philosophers um, of hope uh, was uh, Ernst Bloch. Ernst Bloch wrote numerous books about hope, which are almost identical to each other. I mean, I think he 
wrote too many books about hope, but it seems that um, he, he, he defined hope in terms of this no idea of not yet, right? So like he, he kind of probably felt like he has not yet grasped the real nature of hope every time he finished the book, so he kept writing. So he embodied this, uh, the, 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 the mode of being not yet. But this is just uh, one kind of definition he offers as uh, not yet. It's here, what's important is it's a kind of uh, relatively still unconscious disposed towards its other side, forwards rather than backwards. He's, he's actually implicitly defining hope as a kind of um, 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 something um, analogical but kind of opposite um, to, to uh, um, um, repressed, um, psych 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 psychologically kind of repressed, uh, what is repressed psychologically. So it's not really um, something forgotten, something remembered that has been, something that has sunk into the subconscious in repressed or archaic fashion. It's actually something new that is dawning up that has never been conscious. So, so he wanted to draw attention to this pool, what he calls the pool of what is to come. Um, and, he, he, and, and, then, and then he located what he calls hope in that zone. So, um, so hope is something that coming from the future. Um, and, and this was a kind of challenging concept uh, for philosophy, and um, he you know, repeatedly argued for it uh, in his numerous work. So that's the kind of hope coming from the future. And his colleague, Walter Benjamin, um, had a slightly different idea. They actually uh, arguably stole each other's ideas. Um, and um, what, but like they, they are very different kinds of scholars. I mean, like Brock wrote really long prose and you know, long books, and Benjamin wrote really you know, um, short, um, uh, mysterious passages. Um, so he had this famous vision of messianic historian who has the gift of finding the spark of hope in the past. So for him, um, hope um, actually comes from the past to some extent, and then you, the, the past unfulfilled hopes still uh, are there to be, to be uh, brought back to um, um, the world to be fully realized. And um, that's a different uh, sort of um, uh, temporal um, uh, horizon for hope. So we have this hope coming from the future and hope coming from the past in, in the figures of uh, these two figures. And there are different kinds of hope um, proposed by different philosophers. Um, radical hope, Jonathan Lear, who is a philosopher at the University of Chicago, recently wrote, not so recently, 10 years ago, well, radical hope. And in his definition, hope is directed towards uh, future goodness that transcends the current ability to understand what it is. So, and then, so in, the, in that kind of situation, he thinks the courage to to venture into this territory of, of the unknown is really key. Um, so that's a kind of radical, kind of heroic hope to some extent. Um, Alan Mittelman, who is also a quite important uh, Jewish theologian, uh, philosopher in New York, um, he wrote a book called Hope in a Democratic Age in which he argued that we need to, to conceptualize hope as a virtue and then we only need hope in moderation. So he has kind of moderate hope. Uh, and um, then we also have a minimalist hope uh, put forward by Peter Redfield in his work um, among doctors, uh, doctors in Doctors Without Borders. Um, so doc as you probably know, doctors I mean, and Doctors Without Borders tend to work in really hopeless situations in which uh, they have to attend each patient, attend to each patient one each case one by one without really being able to imagine that any radical change for the good will take place. So in that context, like doctors have to work and keep going without this minimum, minimum kind of um, form of hope. So we have this the, the continuum from the radical hope to minimalist hope. So. The question is what to do with these different conceptualizations of hope. And we all have different kinds of hope, but that's one thing, but also there are different kinds of 
um, hope put forward in, in relation to different uh, kinds of situations. So um, about uh, 14 years ago, I wrote a book called The Method of Hope. And um, um, the, the, the framework for the book is, is, uh, is uh, the is, is the um, anthropological theory of the gift uh, as a model of, of, of hope. And, um, um, and, 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 and I, I, in this book, I um, offered uh, um, a vision of ethnographic work as um, participation in and replication of others' hopes. Um, and then I argued that in order to capture other people's hope, you actually have to replicate that hope in, in, in your own engagement with those hopes. So um, here I had a kind of very minimalist uh, definition of hope um, as reorientation, uh, reorienting from failure, disappointment to another kind of hope, the future, the reorienting from the past to the future. Um, and. Um, and then another um, key element in my conceptualization of hope was replication, repetition. So the, this is kind of combination of uh, Benjamin and Bloch to some extent. Like, so past hopes are important, but, but, but important as kind of resources for recreating um, hopeful um, um, the gesture towards the future. And, and the past, form, past hope informs inform um, um, the, the future hope. So, so reorient, reorientation and replication were two kind of technical um, elements uh, in my definition of hope there. Um, and then I, I um, also argue that hope cannot be approached as a subject, um, um, uh, but we should um, approach it and embrace it as a method, and a method of, of academic inquiry itself a method of life, and, and what we study is really the relationship um, between, between uh, among different kinds of hope at different levels of uh, um, um, appearance. But the, so so I'm one of the reviewers uh, of my first book um, 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 entitled uh, his review as Distilled Hope. Um, so, so my book um, indeed distilled this really rich uh, notion of hope to two technical operations, reorientation and um, replication uh, in that book. Um, but in the economy of hope, um, we, well, for one thing, this is not just about my own work, but um, uh, the book collects uh, several prominent scholars' um, uh, reflections on hope um, based on um, very different um, kinds of um, materials. Um, so here, I, for me, um, the challenge was to what to do with um, the multiplicity of, of, of hope, the conceptions of hope. So what to do with hope's multiplicity, um, theoretically, analytically. And, and of course, there are lots of techniques of hope um, um, introduced in this book, including humor or irony um, in Richard's work. Um, um, but my, for me, um, what I wanted to invest in the title of hope is this idea of economy, uh, not so much an economy of scarcity, a scarcity versus um, um, abundance, but economy as exchange. And, um, and I, I like to put forward, I mean, this is related to my um, originally um, question about hope, the relationship between hope and the, and the notion of a gift. But, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to um, here um, put forward idea of hope as exchange, or even the idea of exchanging the hopes. So I'd like to introduce uh, some chapters very quickly. Um, Catherine Verdi was a very prominent uh, scholar of post-socialist uh, um, societies, um, wrote a really nice chapter uh, about uh, this uh, uh, clash of uh, utopian socialist communist hopes and really quotidian um, hopes of um, uh, farmers who are subjected to uh, uh, collectivization. 
Um, and, and here, what she does is like um, re really exchanging utopian hopes that really created really a really violent situation with really mundane hopes for survival under, under the regime. And, 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 and in, in, in this analysis, she also thinks about her, her own disappointment with socialism. You know, like most uh, st students of socialism kind of believed in the, the, and the ideals of socialism, in, in, including herself, and, 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 and then she, she kind of had to sort of try to discover human dimensions of socialism somehow in a very violent situation. She was observing, and she found in those very mundane, quotidian efforts to survive um, hope. Yuji Gendam, uh, who is a leader in um, a really public debate about hope in Japan for the last two decades, so wrote a really interesting um, chapter for this volume called Hope and Society in Japan. And here um, he offers a very particular kind of um, technique of hope. Um, but he was writing against uh, um, hope entailed in neoliberal reform. Uh, neoliberalism was also a very hopeful project um, in retrospect. Um, it, was, uh, it was an effort to really break open uh, the future um, in a situation that it was saturated with all kinds of, um, you know, um, archaic, inefficient, inefficient uh, institutions. So it was a kind of hopeful, utopian, hopeful, ut in a utopian project and hopeful project. So against that background, he offers um, something different. Um, so he argues that um, neoliberalism, maybe with a commitment to problem solving, um, accountability, or that, really shrunk what he calls space for play. So he kind of points to um, all kinds of different examples, like um, in the Japanese painting often has this space, wasted space. Um, Japanese modern house also has lots of wasted space. Um, so he, he likes, he kind of celebrates the idea of uh, wasted efforts that may or may not result in anything really constructive. So um, he also talks about the, this, um, um, uh, space um, engineer and train engineers um, um, leave between train tracks um, when you know it get, gets hot the you know train tracks kind of ex expand and that space really you know helps um, keep uh, the tracks straight so he wants to see that kind of space space wasted space I mean this this in this case this kind of, it's not really wasted but um, it's a functional reason but um, that kind of space, um, wasted space for play, as a locus for hope, and and um, and and, and um, um, in, for him, the really the the key idea is asobi that play, um, and and when um, society shrinks um, room for play, also hope the space for hope um, shrinks. He argues. Um, Jane Geyer, a um, really prominent Africanist um, um, anthropologist, um, um, wrote, wrote a really interesting essay about um, West African entrepreneurs. Um, and and, and she, she is, was struck by the, the really the, uh, persistent, optimistic um, outlook of uh, West African entrepreneurs, despite the fact that the the, the, what they you know come up with uh, often fails repeatedly so um, from uh, you know um, bicycle um, repair shop to uh, uh, what have you so uh, so she observes that the um, entrepreneurs West African entrepreneurs from uh, move from one niche to another and bring while you know they move from one niche to another they bring with themselves certain things from the past and then replicate them and refashion uh, the techniques and experiences and then keep, and keep trying uh, new things. So, and then um, what's, what makes her analysis really interesting is that in this chain of replications, um, she sees, actually, the, 
she's and the, the entrepreneurs see a really a long vista, um, like a, almost an experience of eternity. So it's in, in this repetitions of the, this similar set of things, um, you know, refashioned again and again, um, they also experience um, the infinite possibility of extension. Um, so here um, she talks about um, um, the really famous uh, phrase, hope springs eternal. So hope kind of springs, right, like from one place to another, but then sort of in, in springing, um, the, the actors experience um, um, what, what goes beyond time. So um, I, I, mean, I, I don't want to spend um, um, all the time we have, but um, I, I have a chapter, Obama's Hope, um, in which um, I, I talk about um, 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 Obama's kind of embrace of this fairly kind of Christian idea of hope for what is not seen um, and the connection between belief and hope, um, an idea of faith as a substance or support for hope. Um, but um, um, he also differentiates hope from blind optimism, as you recall from uh, now, like almost 10 years ago. Um, hope is the thing, that thing inside us that insists, despite all evidence to the, to the contrary, that something better awaits us if we have the courage to reach for it and to work for it and to fight for it. But my analysis really focuses on how contagious um, his hope was. And as you recall, we were all excited. Um, and then um, partly because I think we, we kind of replicated Obama's hope. We, some of us kind of ended up being disappointed with him um, in, <laughs> in his presidency. But um, I think what he offered was hope for, for all of us, right? And um, he kept saying, actually, during the campaign that it was not he himself who would bring about change, but you, right? I mean, that was kind of a, you know, not really, a, that move is, was not, not, there was nothing new in that move, but that was kind of significant in, in, in terms of the, in terms of uh, the contagion of um, his hopefulness and hope. And, 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 and his hope itself also was kind of not really, op, um, also a not really kind of optimistic hope, it was a very difficult hope hope for what is not seen. So there was a really um, complex, interesting opportunity at that time for us to really think um, carefully about, about what hope was all about. But somehow, um, in the midst of uh, um, political maneuvers and game, we perhaps lost the chance to um, uh, think about um, um, hope uh, more deeply than uh, beyond that campaign. So um, just to conclude, I'm um, now thinking beyond this volume, and I'm thinking more in terms of um, um, hope as a kind of a gift. Um, hope is, is something that comes from elsewhere. Um, so when, when, you, when you conceptualize hope in social terms or interactional terms, I think this, 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 this is a key um, perspective, one of the key perspectives, I think. I think hope other people have for you really affects the way you, you organize yourself towards the future. I mean, your parents' expectations for you, your peers' expectations for you. So, so that's, uh, or, or even like hope for the future, you know, maybe the future is actually pulling you, or the hope in the past is, is actually um, shaping the way you hope. So, I would like to put forward an, 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 the idea of hope as a gift from elsewhere, from other people. And then you have to respond to, to that hope. So, and then, and, and then so, so in that sense, hope really exists in social exchange. So exchanging, and, and then ex, in exchanging hopes and expectations, we actually create hope for ourselves. So, so indeed, there are many, many different kinds of hopes. Right? But, and, and each hope is significant in its own context. But what is important is not to really um, you know, choose one hope over another, but, but respond to, to, uh, to the hope given to you, and then 
kind of replicate or creatively um, um, it as, as your own hope. So that's, that's the kind of uh, where I am at the moment, the idea of hope as a gift. So with that um, note, I'd like to um, invite Richard to, to offer something um, more humorous. Okay. Yes. Huh? So uh, my uh, little bit here is called A Bit on Hope, and I've chosen the title because it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And at the bottom here, you see a visualization of hope, a very famous one by Pisano. And I really have included it only because it's very beautiful and you shouldn't really go away from a talk on hope without um, having seen it. So this, uh, here you can see it, it's an angel stretching out its hands against we don't really know what, and it is on the, on the doors of the famous uh, baptistry in Florence. So this is really what it looks like, the door here, you can see it from the 1300s. These are these beautiful doors on the baptistry. So the baptistry is this place where you are baptizing people. And the baptistry is part of uh, the Cathedral of Florence, which has the marvelous, marvelous, marvelous dome by Br Br Brunelleschi. And, you know, they talk about these things that you should do, like 10 things before you die and all of that. So one of the things you really should uh, do is to go to Florence and see the Duomo. It's just the most gorgeous, beautiful building uh, in the world. Yeah. In this book, The Economy of Hope, I have written uh, two chapters, one called The Sociological Approach to Hope in the Economy. I'm a sociologist, so that's why I've written that. And the other one is called Mercantilist Utopian Projects in 18th Century Sweden, because I'm Swedish, so that comes naturally to me. <laughs> so uh, the first thing then is, you know, what have sociologists written? Uh, about hope, and they haven't written very much, but the few things they have written is not uninteresting. So here are two small examples. There are others. Max Weber in his Sociology of Religion talks about hope, you know, the hope of the poor people that crystallizes out in their desire for charismatic leaders and so on. One of them is a very handsome quote by Emil Durkheim. And here it is, and uh, I put the text in green. I'm actually green, red, colorblind, so I hope it is green. I'm not totally sure. And uh, Durkheim here, you know, is one of the classics. He helped to start sociology around 1900. Um, he, of course, takes a social viewpoint. He says that hope is total social construction. And he will do it in a very nice way. He will also say that all sentiments are social. And uh, uh, he will, you know, he, he was very interested in what he called la vie sérieuse, you know, the serious part of life. And this quote is also quite beautifully phrased and also quite astounding. I should say as a sort of like a little footnote that I do not believe that hope is social. I believe it actually much more biological. I think you can make about the same argument about hope as you can do that Chomsky does about language. I don't think children socialize into hope. I think they have it. Then, just like if you are born in Norway or in Turkey, you will of course speak Norwegian or Turkish because that's the social surrounding. Anyway, here we are talking about Birkham and not me. And you can see here how he says, hope has not miraculously fallen from heaven into our hearts, but must have, like all the sentiments, been formed under the influence of the facts. Thus, if men have learned to hope, if under the blows of misfortune they have grown accustomed to turn their gaze towards the future and to expect from it compensation for their present suffering, see, it's la vie sérieuse here, it is because they are perceived that such compensation occurred frequently that the human organism is both too flexible and too resisting to be easily brought down, that the moment when misfortune gained the day were exceptional and that generally the balance ended up by being reestablished. So, you, know, you can take it and you know, sort of try to penetrate. It's an interesting kind of uh, argument, beautifully phrased. Uh, here we have uh, another uh, person, sociologist, Ralph Dahrendorf, famous German sociologist, was in a concentration camp during World War II for his opposition to the Nazis, later went on to become a famous sociologist, the head of LSE, a member of the European Parliament, basically a social democrat. And what he's interested in because of his division of hope into realistic hope and utopian hope, 
So, you know, the social democrats basically say, let's keep capitalism, it's sort of useless, but we'll tax them so, and we'll use the revenues for, you know, health care and so on and so forth. That's a realistic hope. That's something you can do. And then, of course, you have the utopian hope, which for a social democrat would be to everyone according to their needs, or, you know, the Marxist communist utopia, etc. So, uh, uh, I'll come back a little bit to his ideas. That's why I have them here. So in my paper, I also try to define hope. You have heard a lot of definitions from here or here, and I will make, give you a definition uh, that is a little bit sociological or done so you can treat it sociologically. So what exactly is hope? So I'm suggesting that we can see hope as a wish for something to come true. So this wish, you know, is it social or is it biological? Well, we don't know. But we know that when you wish for something, that most certainly is social. You know, it depends on the society you grew up in. And also, can it come true or not? That is very social. You know, that's the difference, among other things, between realistic and utopian hope. I've used different colors here, a wish for something to come true, because I think that to have, you know, just hope as green, the color of hope and the color of growth, is too little. I think that uh, hope is much more multifaceted than that. So in order to you know, show you how to make or how I make a sociological analysis of hope, I'll bring in another uh, quote here. And that is from Kierkegaard. So Kierkegaard is the beginning of the 1800s. It's the Danish golden age, H.C. Andersen, fairy tales, you know, all of that. And in his famous Either Or, which is from the 1840s, he will tell you that hope is something that can gently start off start you off on something. You know, a little bit like Albert Hirschman will talk about, that the entrepreneur needs a helping hand. But it's very dangerous to let sort of hope overtake your enterprise. So the nice quote is, it's indeed beautiful to see a person put out to sea with a fair wind of hope. One may utilize the chance to let oneself be towed, towed away, but one ought never have it on board one's craft least of all as a pilot, for it is an untrustworthy shipmaster. So, you know, sort of like interesting. So I sort of like have done this a uh, little bit, uh, uh, you know, I'm using this kind of dimension. So here you can see the Kierkegaardian overtaking, hope is overtaking you, you know, it's steering your life. But it can also be inspiring. And then hope can be passive and active. And then, a bit impressionistically, I put different things in here. So you can see that, you know, if you sort of buy lottery, I mean, you sort of hope that you're going to win something, and you sort of sit there with your lottery tickets, so that's sort of passive and inspiring. You can see how entrepreneurship or creative economic actions, inspiring and active, I, you know, I have digging for gold here. You see these guys on television, right? Those Alaskan, whatever they are, gold diggers, etc. Economic utopias, it sort of like can overtake you, you know, what will be. I've sort of put in the American dream here. I guess it's sort of as uh, Hero says, it's sort of like moving around a little bit like that. So that's my first chapter. I'm trying to define hope. I'm trying to do it sociologically. My second chapter, it's called Mercantilist Utopian Projects in 18th Century Sweden. The map that you're seeing is a contemporary map. So in the 18th century, Sweden consisted of Sweden and Finland. Now, the background to the talk is, is that in the 1600s, Sweden was a big, important military power. And it then didn't only have Sweden and Finland, it had all the land here. So the Baltic Sea, which is this, was actually an inland sea for the Swedes. And then the beginning of the 1700s, the Swedes were knocked out by the Russians, you know, in military battles. And from that point on, Sweden became that little small country that it is today. So it wasn't a great, wonderful uh, power any longer. So, you know, it fell into this misfortune, which of course, you can figure out, was a great fortune for Sweden. So the 1700s was the golden age of Sweden. And the reason for this is that you have no more wars. So instead of having the peasant boys march, you know, they march from Sweden to Russia to fight there, etc. And having all of the taxes taken for the military, it's now spent inside Sweden. So as a result, you know, everything is thriving. The culture, the economy, the population. And there are just these waves of hope in Sweden. 
and they are all taking the form of mercantilism, you know, which is the ideology at the time. And Sweden at this time is producing sort of world-leading kind of uh, intellectuals. Linnaeus, you all know, the botanist Celsius, you know, Americans believe in Fahrenheit, right? <laughs> and then you have Varientin, who you don't know about, but Varientin created the first really stable population statistics, uh, an agency for, uh, uh, for handling that kind of stuff. So in this time, and we're now focusing mostly on the economy, there were lots of utopian projects, and they were all mercantilist in spirit. So mercantilism is a lot of things, but one of the things you know from Trump, right, Mr. Economic Nationalist, is that you know, exports and imports, you know, you don't want to import too much. You know, you want to keep the riches in the country. That's the thing. So what you want to do is that you want to eliminate imports. So Linnaeus wanted to make Sweden very rich. And he wanted to eliminate ec imports of the form of tea, coffee, tobacco, certain kind of glass, etc., by creating this inside Sweden. So he wanted to turn Sweden into a self-supporting paradise on Earth. So Lapland, very cold, was going to be the Caribbean of the North. And he had his disciples, you know, students, right? Those were his disciples. He had his students sent out all over the world to Japan, Latin America, North America, etc., to bring back coffee plants, tea plants, a lot of different trees, etc. And these were all going to be planted in Sweden, and Sweden would then be so rich, etc. This general idea that Sweden was a very rich country was very strong also in the political sphere. So they started several enterprises to map out all the riches. So they started to count every human being. They started to count every animal. They started to count every tool. They put a price on it. And they were sort of exploding out in these very utopian uh, calculations about Sweden. Sweden could hold about 10 times as many people, etc. Sweden had an Academy of Science, you know this one. This is the one that gives the Nobel Prizes today. It was created in the 1700s. And they were part of this whole, these whole hopeful mercantilist uh, projects. So they encouraged the scientists and people to send in to them a lot of projects that uh, you know, would help to uh, realize these uh, riches. Well, the result of all of this, I've written, is the unpredictable nature of hope. So Linnaeus' projects failed totally. I mean, they brought all of these coffee plants, silk plants, you know, silk uh, worms and so on to Sweden, and they just failed. He was particularly interested in having tea grown in Sweden. And Sweden has about the same uh, winter as Ithaca. So, you know, he kept these sort of fires around the few tea bushes in Uppsala, and they just sort of like died. So that sort of like just died out. This wild and crazy attempt to quantify each object, productive force in Sweden, that also failed. The government who was doing this after a while sort of thought this was sort of useless. But out of it, you know, came this modern notion of population statistics. You know, so there was sort of these wild dreams, but something realistic came out of it also. There were also attempts during this time to make the peasants cultivate a new crop, which was the potato. And this just failed. The peasants didn't want it. You know, they just didn't want it. They're conservative. They want to bet on the kind of crops that they were used to. One scientist suggested to the Swedish Academy of Sciences that the potato can also be used for alcohol. It was a woman scientist, a nobility woman. And this idea that you could make alcohol out of potato made the peasants change their mind. They wanted alcohol, so the potato <laughs> spread through Sweden like a wildfire. And, you know, after a while, you know, the state went against this, not because they didn't want drunken peasants, but they wanted to have taxation on the alcohol. So they wanted to, Sweden still has, you know, in America you have liquor store, you just go in and buy a bottle of whiskey. In Sweden you have certain stores that the state is running which are selling the liquor. But the result anyway was that Sweden, you know, got a new crop, the potato. So these, again, these sort of like utopian ideas resulted in something else. So here's my end uh, uh, thing, that, you know, hope is sort of part of life. You never know exactly what it will lead to. This is a famous painting called Hope by Gustav Klimt. 
And you know, the idea that hope is sort of like pregnancy is sort of like a nice kind of metaphor. Now, of course, you know that a child, after nine months, it's sort of like is being born. And with hope, we never sort of like know that. You also know that you can't say that you're a little pregnant, right? You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. But hope, in hope, you are a little pregnant. You know, everybody is a little bit pregnant with hope. So that's my talk. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I, I really enjoyed this talk. Um, and I wanted to go back, Hiro, to a, um, a point you made at the beginning. And you, you said you'd come back to the idea that hope is neither negative or positive. Um, and, you know, you can hope for make America great again, or um, right, you can hope for a, a white Christian nation. You can hope for um, a multicultural nation. So if you can speak to that, right, positive, negative, and, and especially um, I'm thinking because um, you talked about journeying with others, right, through hope. And yeah, so just if you can expand on that a little bit more. Yeah, yeah I, I hope that's um, um, a difficult question. But uh, um, I would like to say that um, just like Richard, I, I don't think we, we can really predict where one's hope goes and what kind of things one's hope would, will yield, right? So, so there are always unintended consequences and unintended effects. And so um, it's, it's actually di very difficult to really judge which hope is good or, or bad. And, and even if, and, you know, you face a really repugnant hope, right, or violent hope, um, I, you know, so I, what I like to sort of suggest is that what we should do is to exchange that hope with something else. So instead of just, um, you know, you know, so it's really about exchanging one kind of hope to another that reorients things, and that itself is enough for for the present. You know, but even if you know you think you your hope is a better hope than others, you don't know, right? So, so and um, so that's that's basically the point. So so. As a solution to hope's multiplicity, I would like to offer that the, the, the exchanging hope can be uh, one way to, to, to uh, one, one kind of response to, to good or bad hopes that you may discern in the world. Uh, also very interesting, thank you very much. Uh, may, I was wondering if we could s separate individual and collective hope. They say that the secret of happiness is so, a job to do, someone to love, and hope. However, you are saying that the collective hope kind of lost, no? In Japan, in relation with the earthquake, and here because of political turmoil. And so how do you, the collective and the individual hope, how do you combine both? <laughs> well, I think, um, so the collective versus, the distinction between individual and collective hope is kind of false. Um, I think every hope is relational and social. So, um, so in that sense, um, you know, yeah, I mean, we have to kind of approach this quite common like, distinction between collective and individual hope as uh, one technique we have to differentiate right, or reorient uh, one's hope to some extent, right? Like, not every, I mean, collective hope is good, obviously, and, you know, what collective hope can be really oppressive, like, you know, socialist utopian hope. Um, more, um, and, but um, I don't think we have individual hope. We hope is something 
you cultivate or maintain or lose in relation to something. Um, so, so, so I think one important message I think this volume wants to um, transmit is that every hope is relational and we have to understand hope in that context. And we, in the politics of hope really happens in, in, in what I call the economy of hope, that is exchanging Oops. Let, let me add to a little bit to that. I mean, I think that you know you can talk about hope also being a collective good, in the sense that you know you can grow up in a society where there's a lot of sound hope. People sort of like have thought about it. You know, it sort of is a tradition. So to grow up in a society without hope, you know, that's something negative. So the idea that it is just the interaction that is just individual. That's not, I think, correct. I mean, the correct thing is that, of course, it always comes through the individual. If you grow up in this kind of culture, you as an individual would channel it, etc. But the idea of collective good that I actually have taken from Hero, uh, I think that's a good idea. That's a good notion. That's a helpful one. Thanks very much for. Oh. One question. Richard, uh, I like the Kierkegaard quote, um, and he, if one were to interpret that, uh, he says, good to have hope, but don't count on it, uh, as a uh, something that would lead to a successful voyage. Uh, that is right. uh, good to set out with hope, but if you were to count on it as the, something that would produce an outcome, uh, you probably shouldn't. Um, so that raised the interesting question because certainly the social sciences has been interested in cause, uh, causality, uh, and much of theorizing has tried to uh, focus on that. And with hope, the question is, is there a causal element in, say, collective hope uh, that would give the idea of traction for the social sciences? Well, I mean, I think the hope, like in the economy, that can overtake you. It's like, you know, there's sort of like this boom on the stock market. I mean, there's sort of like people are sort of buying into that and they're going into it. And, um, you know, I think you can operationalize it if you want. Uh, and it's not easy, like, with any phenomena that you can really do it. Um, so I think the idea that overtaking you, that is just like any kind of emotion that is overtaking you, you know, can be relatively bad. That would be my sense. Sartre has written about hope, and he sees hope in the following way, and that is that it's sort of like the overarching project you have. Like a student at Cornell has the overarching project of sort of like getting a degree, getting a job, and so on. So all the small actions, you know, you go to home in the library and borrow things and take all these courses are part of this overarching project. And I think that's sort of like a nice idea. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. um, so I wanted to ask you about the relationship between reason and hope, because we often uh, hear them depicted as alternatives to one another, and in visual depictions as well, they're often put as alternatives to one another. Um, and yet, I get the sense in your presentation that for you, they're not alternatives to one another. And so I wanted to ask you about the relationship between reason and hope, and can we have reasoned hope? Well, you know, in, uh, you know, Immanuel Kant writes in Critique of Pure Reason that there are certain things that are important for you. What should I do? What can I know? And what can I hope? So, you know, this is Mr. Reason, Mr. Basist Aufklärung, right? So, I mean, I think that hope and reason can very much go together. Yeah, that would be my answer. Well, so my answer to Victor's question and your question would be, um, you know, related to my <coughs> kind of effort to see hope in terms of exchange. So exchange really goes beyond the, goes beyond, it moves away from the, this causation Right. It's really not really about cause and effect, but it's really the, this constant exchange that generates something that goes beyond it. Right? Circular. Yeah, yeah, 
I guess. Yeah, circular causation, I guess. So there's also uh, reason, too. So um, yes, hope often really um, calls for this question, you know, you know, whether hope can be justified, if there's a rationale for hope. But I think I, I would like to shift um, that question um, to the, the, the question of exchange. So it's really not about um, justification, but it's, um, and because hope is not really something that, um, that, 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 that operates as a either starting point or end point, but it is something that is generated in an act of exchange, and there's nothing more than that. Um, what is the difference between hope and aspiration? Um, is there a difference? Well, I mean, I think here at Cornell, they were administering a Temple Fund grant, you know, lots of money going out for studies of hope. And I read a lot of these kinds of proposals. And, you know, so there were all of these people who wanted, who did, you know, the normal research and wanted to get money out to study hope. So they were using these terms, you know, like optimism and aspiration and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, so my basic idea is that when you're having a new topic in academia, which is what hope is, academics haven't studied hope before, then you shouldn't really sort of like use a lot of old terms and the old operationalizations. You sort of like really try, you have to try to do something novel. So, you know, we could sort of discourse on the semantic history of aspiration and you know, which, soci which psychologists use it and so on and so forth. But I think that, you know, the way where you want to start is that there is something new. You want to capture something new. So don't sort of like jump on the old tramways that go from A to B because you'll end up at B. You know, this is Max Weber's famous metaphor for, you know, if you sort of like use old ideas, you jump on the tramway here and it takes you there. So that's the, so I'm not, you know, I'm not that interested in sort of like diving into that thing. You know, I think the people who are interested in aspiration should dive into hope instead. That would be nice. Yeah, yeah I, I don't agree, but I think um, um, there are, I mean, aspiration can be one element of hope, of one kind of hope. Um, but uh, I think when the, the, we have to think about why we are talking about hope as opposed to other things like more conventional subjects like expectations, aspirations, and whatnot. I think we are drawn to hope, not just because we are both hopeful people, but because hope is really um, deeply paradoxical and it contains within itself so many different things. Like from, you can put like fear, disappointment, uh, disappointment or or this even despair can be folded into the idea of hope. So we would like to, we I think wanted to capture that richness and its paradoxicality um, um, and as a, as a challenge for the social sciences. And, and, and in the end, you know, that's how humans are to some extent. We are all paradoxical, contradictory beings. And if hope is life, and that's the way it is. Please join me in thanking our authors for talking to us.